Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to this house of worship. I especially want to extend a welcome home to Shirley and to Jeff and Patty and Susan and Katie and Donna and all your families and everyone connected to those families, all your friends, and of course the many who could not make it today but who are with us in spirit. This is a wonderful gathering on a very special day, like no other. Let me just say a couple of words before I move into my other remarks to welcome you. When the service finishes, you will be uh, handed a very important sheet of calisms, so you don't want to miss that. <laughs> we did not give this out to you coming in because we knew you'd be paying attention to that, so that's your gift, uh, gift bag kind of on the way out. Uh, so the ushers will be handing that to you. And now as you move up, of course you're all invited to come to the reception to greet Shirley and the family and others into the Great Hall, which is just out the door and up and to the right. And we encourage you to just move into the Great Hall. Oftentimes what happens, people line up and there's a big line and they stand on the stairs forever. Don't do that. Move into the Great Hall and then the time will come when you can go and greet the family and meanwhile you can have coffee and all kinds of goodies and, uh, and a chance to visit with each other as well. It is right that we are gathered here in this place where faith is celebrated and named and where prayers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God are offered week in and week out, where the story of God's undying love for the world is told here again and again, and where the hope of resurrection and eternal life is proclaimed. And it's here in this place where that big 10 pound baby was brought <laughs> some 92 years ago and offered to God in baptism. And I dare say it was that identity that this man sought to live out for the full 92 years that he lived. So it's that story, not just Roland's story, but the story of faith that sets the stage for the hope that we long for and yearn for today in our gathering. And it's what sets the stage for our remembrance of Roland's life. Not just in terms of what has been, but as well in terms of what is yet to be. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul from Romans, words that Roland would have heard many times from this pulpit. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So come, my friends, let us join our hearts and voices together in song of grateful praise to God, who makes this occasion an occasion for hope and joy. Please stand.
eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. Especially today, in this moment, we praise you for Roland, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all of these, grant your peace. Let perpetual light shine upon them and help us to believe where we have not yet seen, that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your presence, eternal in the heavens. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> in this service, many words will be spoken and shared. Some will be ancient, reaching back before any of us existed and drawing upon a tradition of hope and faith and love. And those words are among the most important words we need to hear in times such as this. And then, as we move into the service, as you see, there are going to be many other voices that are going to speak that will seek to bring to the foreground in our memories our own recollections of Roland and his life and legacy. And I'm not going to introduce them as they go, they will just come up as their time uh, is indicated in the bulletin. And all of these words together are what we need to hear, what need to be spoken in this time and on this day. Our first scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Our second reading is from the second letter to the Corinthians. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but what and cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. And our last reading from 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. <clears throat>
And that's when my father, James Kent Calvin, was born. And he was born in the house on Greenwood Avenue, 740 Greenwood Avenue, where all of us grew up and participated. And a uh, very, very special place. And then eight years later, in 1925, as it says in your bulletin, Roland was born. He was, he, I think he was the first one that was not born in, in a house. Uh, he was born in Evanston Hospital, which is where I was born. Uh, and uh, but when he came home, I was not there. But I'm certain that my father just loved him right away. I mean, the eight-year difference and the big father, the big brother, little brother situation, I'm sure that thing was it. Also in 1925, earlier that year, our grandfather, my grandfather, uh, James Kent Calhoun Sr., retired from the old Corn Bank. It was a precursor to the Continental Illinois National Bank. It was uh, then eventually, I think, became Bank of America, but it, it dated back to well before the Chicago Fire. So this is a prestigious bank. And his, his retirement president, you know, we used to get wristwatches, he got a grandfather clock for his retirement president. That grandfather clock came from downtown Chicago and was placed in the hallway between the dining room and the sun parlor at the foot of the stairs, where it ticked off every quarter hour. And, and I'm certain that they heard that clock every quarter hour in that, in that home. So that, that home, that, that clock just stood as a, as, a, as a sentinel to all the things that happened in 740 Greenwood. Which all of we know. I mean, all of you know that clock, right? Beautiful clock, beautiful clock. But that's not the point. As as Roland grew up, of course it's not. As Roland, as Roland and Dad grew up, they 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 started doing everything together. Uh, Jim, my dad, loved Roland. I'm certain that Roland idolized. That. I know he idolized my dad. They looked up to each other. They did everything together. They would build things together. The basement of the 740 Greenwood was big, huge, many rooms. And they built a train set down there. Not just any train set, but I mean, trains were coming in and out of the furnace room, in and out of all the other rooms. This was a magnificent train set. I saw the remnants of it uh, later on. But, but, and they, they did all kinds of things. In fact, they quickly became known as the Or Orville and Wilbur of Glencoe, Illinois. <laughs> they built things, and they built things on a small, on not a, not a small scale, a very large scale. They built boats together, most memorably. And the last boat they built together was a cabin cruiser, 22 feet long, a twin engine, which they built themselves in the, in the garage. There. It was just magnificent. So I have so many wonderful memories of, of those boats and learning how to water ski and learning how to do strange things in the water. In fact, there was one thing that I'm, I thought that Roland had invented. It's a thing called the nitwit. Remember the nitwit? Okay. And I thought for sure he had invented it until about 18 years later I saw another one. It was just like, it. ask me later about that because I've got a time limit on this. So, as they continue on, Roland and my dad just were inseparable. They were the epitome of brotherly love. And, and it was just a beautiful thing to see, okay? And to grow up with. I got notes here because I got time on it. <laughs> so we used to do vacations together, do all kinds of things. I will not elaborate on that, just to say that we're going to fast forward now to 1993. Big span of time, a lot of things happened. In 1993, my dad passed away. And I remember that just like it was yesterday. Uh, I was not there at the instant when he passed away, but when I did get there, which is a few minutes after he died, Wong was by his side, by his side, saying goodbye to his dear brother. And that, that image is in my brain forever. Now, I am blessed with a wonderful family. We all are blessed with wonderful families. Wonderful aunts and uncles, grandmother. I never knew my, my grandfather, at least I'm wrong. Father, uh, but we and I, I can't imagine going through life without the influence of family and nephews and, 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 and cousins and things like this, and, and, and we took from all of that. But during life, the biggest life lessons I have ever received have been from those two men, those two giants, Jim and Roland. Jim, of course, is my dad. 
but Roland was probably, next to my dad, the biggest influence in my life. In fact, at the risk of being sacrilegious, I used to, all through life, ask, what would Roland do? <laughs> and to this day, I still ask, what would Roland do? He was that important in my life. So, about a year ago, I received a phone call from Roland. He was so, so good about staying in touch with family. I mean, he just, he really was all about family. And he just called the back fence, is what he and Dad used to call it. They just back fence. And we were, we were sitting, talking, and having a conversation, and all of a sudden the clock chimed. And he stopped in mid-sentence. He said, is that? And I said, yep. And we both sat silent for a few moments, just letting all the memories waft in. And so, if you're like me, in the next few months, or the next year, or the next years, there'll be times when you miss him, miss him sorely. And if that happens, give me a call, go back fence, and listen to the clock today. Roland Blanchard Calhoun. That was his given name to us, to his business associates, his friends, and his family. He was simply known as Cal. Surely he would refer to him as Cal. I don't know about Jeff and Patty, and <laughs> but he was Cal. Anyway, I was asked to give a short a dissertation about Cal for many years. Uh, with the Mills Winfield organization, where he was highly respected and spent 36 years of his working life. My name is Werner Shagan. I became the president of Mills Winfield Engineering after Cal retired in 1988. He led our company with offices located in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota by being a mentor. He also served as somebody to admire emulate, not only in our day-to-day -day business dealings, but also in our personal lives. He led by example. I'd like to summarize and provide a little, uh, some pertinent chapters of the company's 88-year history. So I, I'm going to um, condense a lot of it um, based on time. But the original roots of Mills and Winfield date back to the early 1930s. There are rumors that Vic Winfield came calling on a fellow by the name of Goggin that was also involved in the original one of the founders, selling ties. Uh, now, I don't think Vic ever told us that, but that was the rumor. So I, I, I believe him, and Vic also referred to himself many times as a peddler, a salesman. Uh, it went from a partnership uh, to a proprietorship, and then they separated in 1952. Mills Incorporated under the name of Mills Engineering Sales, Inc., and Winfield Incorporated under Winfield Engineering Sales, Inc. Cal joined Mills Winfield Engineering as a vice president in 1952. While the companies no longer shared office space or personnel, they continued in a contiguous office space uh, in the old colony building at 407 South Dillon Street, downtown Chicago. With a lot of interaction and cooperation, both companies continued their operation as manufacturers' representatives of industrial equipment. In 1959, the principals of Mills Winfield, of the Mills organization, I should say, uh, saw a need for an equipment line of pulse jet dust collectors. And this is important, this is a real juncture at, at, at the company. Um, and this was needed in the growing environmental market uh, to abate air pollution and also recover product. 
Uh, there were no lines of equipment available, so they determined to design and manufacture their own. This venture required the hiring of a lot of new people, new staff, uh, and they formed a separate company uh, known as FlexClean Corporation. For the sake of brevity, I will jump ahead about 10 years. FlexClean, under their leadership, and Cal, and a lot of our principals were involved in that, uh, became very successful in the environmental equipment uh, was highly regarded and sought after by the industry. And as often happens with up-and-coming companies, they received buyout offers and it was finally sold to a major air pollution control company on the East Coast. This event was a factor in 1968 causing Cal and the other principal owners of Mills and Winfield, including Vic, who was one of the founders, Together, they reorganized Mills and Whitfield organizations and merged them into a new C corporation known as Mills Winfield Engineering. At this point, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge one person among the people that worked there. Her name was Alice Aronson. Alice was hired as a secretary office manager by Mills, Winfield and Company. It goes way back to 1938. We think it's 1938. We're not exactly sure. But it's, it was in that time frame. That she became a corporate secretary of the new company, Mills, Winfield Engineering Sales. And that, uh, she was that, but also she was much more to us. She sort of adopted us and we adopted her as sort of the second mother in the office. Uh, she was thoughtful, kind-hearted, considerate, and everybody loved her. Uh, she retired in 1989. 1938, if that's real, 1989. That's a long time. That's over 50 years. In structuring the new company, the principal owners had the foresight to allow its employees to become shareholders of the company. They had its bylaws and buy-sell agreements that stipulated how shares to the company was to be bought and how they would be sold back to the company. Uh, the employee ownership was beneficial to the corporation and to our employees. It gave a voice to all the shareholders and the operation and strategy of the company. It had greatly diminished the loss of trained and experienced people. It had set up a potential line of succession in the management structure for the future. This was an unusual corporate arrangement for companies such as ours. The company is still privately held, and the transitions in its management ranks have been without controversy as individuals were hired. So when Cal retired in 1988, after 36 years with the company, the reins of leadership were entrusted to me until my retirement in 2000, after 34 years of service. Cal was also very civic-minded, and service to his community was high on his personal agenda. He was a two-term president of the village of Lentholm. He served in the Park and Recreation Board. He raised funds for the North Shore Senior Center. He led the Youth Fellowship Leadership Program. He was a director at the Glencoe Harris Bank for many years. And he was active here in the Glencoe Union Church, where he joined the choir at five. <laughs> in all the years that I worked with him, I don't think he ever sang to us. <laughs> Maybe he did. I and he virtually held every volunteer position at this church. Meant much to me. I'd like to also insert a personal note here of appreciation. Big Whitfield and Justin Williams served as my mentors uh, at the company uh, from the time of my hiring in 1966. But Cal's mentoring did that, but also he dealt with not only the business end, and encouraged me to deal with my civic involvement in my community, which was the village of Addison, 
which was our home for 32 years. There I started a 230 member homeowners organization. I was in the police commission. I was an elected village trustee. And I was a member of the plan commission for 23 years. My wife Mary Ann and I were also very active at our church, St. Paul Lutheran, and at school for the years that we lived there. So I do thank him for his encouragement and guidance. One final impression that I have of Cal and who he really was, and this goes to his essence. One day a group of us came to town, he would inform Bill of his travel plans and the desire to get together. Bill would make plans for lunch and include those of us who had retired. And we would get together and, uh, with him uh, and he, he delighted in the company's achievement and the success of his people. He always enjoyed the time that he spent with us. He was with us on December 11th last year, before Christmas. We sat with him, did a little reminiscing, and shared a meal, and took some pictures to memorialize the event. Calamit meant, meant much to us and to all who knew him, and he will be missed.
we talked about Cal, but there's another person I'd like to introduce you to. So, many, many years ago, uh, my siblings and some of us had the pleasure of having two families here in Glencoe, the Calhoun family and the Bodine family. And we spent much time together. There was one problem with this. When we called Grandpa, were we talking about Roland or George? And in Roland's grand way, one day he decided, I need a nickname. And of course, he loves John Wayne, so he chose Duke. <laughs> to which one of us, grandchildren, who will remain anonymous, said, Duck! <laughs> and then we all repeated it, to which JC was not very happy. And therefore, Grandpa Calhoun became GC. And that is how all of us grandchildren and great-grandchildren, friends, know him as simply GC. So, what we'd like to do today is very simple. Each of us grandchildren and great-grandchildren have come up with a word that they think best represents GC. I will start. Mine is high bike. <laughs> Go ahead. Mine is mentor. Mine is generous. Teacher. Happy. <laughs> Sage. Steadfast. Enlightened. Supportive. I have one for my son who is lovable. Genius. Inspiring. Leader. On behalf of our mother, my sisters, and the ever-growing extended Calhoun family, I'm honored to welcome you all here today for this joyful celebration of the remarkable, extraordinary, and purposeful life of our dad, Roland Calhoun. Anyone who has called their parents and reached the answering machine has heard dad state that he and Shirley were out somewhere doing good, having fun, maybe both. Well, doing good was an understatement for the lifelong legacy Dad established and the acts of service he gave to those he loved. It was what a book I recently finished referred to as an outstanding ancestor, for he planted trees he would never see. He entered the Navy at the age of 19 to serve the country he loved. In 1952, Dad, Mom, and I moved back to Glencoe, the town where Dad grew up and that he loved. Over the next 60 years, he would serve Glencoe in many ways, most significantly as Park District President, Village President, and a member of the Glencoe National Bank Board of Directors. He and his brother Jim, who contributed to the village as partners in the Village Smithy Restaurant. But of course, Dad's most visible service to the community was riding the antique high-wheel bicycle every 4th of July in the parade. I rode alongside Dad a couple of times in the parade, and I could see how he enjoyed adding to the village of enjoyment. Dad loved this church, where he met his God and became a man of unshakable faith. He sang in the choir for 80 years, formed the first high school church youth group, and held most positions of leadership in the church. He led the church auction, and I was lucky to co-auction there with him on several occasions at that event. Dad had no requirement for this day, other than his mandate that when it was time for Dad to go home, we would bring him here. Of all the many acts of service that Dad extended to me and my family, one stands out even beyond the train trips. Debbie and I needed help finishing a major renovation in our kitchen. Dad, then 85, hopped on a plane, and the three of us spent three wonderful days designing, cutting, staining, and installing trim around the cabinets, doors, and windows in our home. We also shared stories and memories as we worked, 
and enjoyed sitting down to supper to watch what we had accomplished each day after we were gone. It was a warm and wonderful time for all of us. Over the last two years, I would help Dad with his projects, those that validated his belief that life is 80% maintenance. <laughs> At this point, he moved more slowly, but time didn't matter. I fetched tools, carried various items and materials for him, finished tasks with, when his energy or dexterity failed him, and made sure he was safe. I helped him in the spirit as he had so often helped me. But most of all, we visited and as we worked, we talked about the family, reminisced about the past, shared hopes for the future, these were among my favorite times with Dad, as we lived up to his mantra, doing good, having fun, always both. If Dad were here with us today, he would remind us all that the true foundation of his success and happiness was sharing a strong and enduring love with our mother, with whom he worked hand in hand as she was his devoted, loving, and supportive wife for over 67 years. So we're talking about the five ways you can show love. I got to do words. Roland Calhoun was a man of many, many words. <laughs> he liked to sing them in the music he loved so much. He liked to share them in the stories he would tell about old Glencoe. He liked to whisper them to crying babies with this magic he had that earned him the nickname, the Baby Whisperer. <laughs> he liked to share them most, oh, he liked to puzzle them out in crosswords, which he used to try to keep his brain sharp, as though anything could dull that man's brilliance. <laughs> and above all, he liked to tie them together into jokes. You've all heard them. <laughs> over and over, Mom can laugh just by giving one suggestion of the joke that's going to come, like the dusty cowboy. We can't tell it in a church, but we can probably tell it at the reception later. <laughs> so Dad was a man of many, many words. He liked big, expressive words, and if there wasn't one he could find, he would make it up, like Huggy Bear or Slumgullion or big shucks. But he also liked perfect little words that captured things. When you were doing, when you were behaving very, very well, the highest compliment he could give you was that you were a very satisfactory child. <laughs> I know, it just made us all glow. <laughs> but it is what his father had said to him too. And when dad, on his last day, decided it was really time to let us know he was ready to go home. You have never heard a man as erudite as he was about how eager he was to get on after a wonderful life to the next chapter. So Dad was a man of many, many words, but he was also a man of his word. Above all, if he told you he was going to do something, like build a cabin cruiser in the driveway, he did. If he told you believed he believed something, he really did. If he told you he would stick by you no matter what you did, he would. And above all, if he told you he loved you, you just felt blessed. As we all should now, he was a very satisfactory man. <laughs> So in my, oh, my category is receiving gifts. So when my kids were about 8 and 12, they each got a check in the mail from my dad. It was $250, and this was really unprecedented. And we quickly found out that all 12 grandchildren got a check for $250 that day. In with the check was a letter that said that you can't spend this money on yourselves or on your family, but you did need to spend it quickly. And the letter said a little bit more about it. He said, 
that it all had to do with something you've heard before, doing good, having fun, maybe both. That that was his mantra. And he explained that everyone's first obligation in this world is to make the world a better place for other people and to spend money on other people so that they could have better lives. And then the fun comes when you see the difference that you can make in people's lives. And then, of course, afterwards, you get a fun reward from that. And he said, make sure you notice that doing good is having fun. So all 12, all 12 grandchildren fell to the task. They researched charities such as Animal Rescue, Doctors Without Borders. They got input from their elementary school principals, from neighborhood firefighters. And if you want to learn a little bit more about this, there's a notebook that will be in the Great Hall that contains his original letters and all 12 letters that the grandchildren wrote back, telling about their philanthropic journey that he had led them on. So by giving the grandchildren this gift, of $250, Dad taught them how to in turn themselves become gift givers. And I think this was his greatest gift, which was teaching. It wasn't just the intentional kind of teaching. He really did relish sitting down with us in our math textbooks. Uh, he loved to sit down the grandchildren and show them the very best way to make a raft and, and three days later it would be done. But I think the best teaching moments were the ones that were kind of spur of the moment. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, and he and I were on a roof building, uh, building some, fixing the shingles, and I was starting to slip off. I was really going to slip off that roof, and he was on the other end of the roof, and he saw what was happening, and he said, jump and don't fall. And you'd be amazed how, in the last four decades, I've reminded myself many times that if you jump and don't fall, you can be intentional and keep some control over the situation, and he was always one to jump and not fall. But there was these on-the-spot teachings that where you would quickly size up a situation and he would say, anything worth doing is worth doing well. And I like, thought that was a bit of a double lesson because it reminded me that there are some things that are not worth doing. So it was a double lesson to be a little bit discerning about, about your undertakings. There's an element of risk in any useful undertaking. And another one, you got to expect losses, which I read as, don't beat yourself up if you're not perfect. Like the very best teachers, he really taught by modeling behavior. He never believed in grudges, in revenge, in regrets, in looking backwards. None of that. He always moved forwards, and he never was a hand wringer. And while he completely, while he loved the complexity of math and engineering, he was grounded in the most simple personal philosophies and appreciations. If something needs doing, you do it. Enjoy every moment. And do good before you have fun, and you're probably doing both. Okay, my uh, category is quality time. So despite all the longevity in Dad's family, he never took time for granted. And he didn't waste a lot of it. He would jump in any time there was an opportunity to connect, entertain, facilitate, support. He was happiest when he felt useful. When it came to the family, his greatest joy was just being together, and he brought us together in a number of ways. He fiercely protected the family dinner table as a daily, uninterrupted ritual. On weekends, he would get us involved, but often in wacky activities around the community and often this church. And then he taught us how to travel with a sense of adventure. Dad would take us on ski trips, boat trips, train trips all over the world, to the top of mountains, bottom of ravines, off the beaten path so we could really discover and explore together. Uh, whether it was finding a perfect 17th century pub hidden in the hills of Scotland, or driving down a sandy dune to a beach in Mexico when we had no idea if the car was going to make it back up. <laughs> it did, of course, because Dad was driving. He, as we grew up, he took time for one-on-one trips with all of us. Um, when I was in eighth grade, he took me on a business trip and introduced me to the most incredible place I'd ever seen, New York City which is now my home. And when Susan, who was in sixth grade, he took her on a snowmobile and adventure to investigate property in a state we had barely heard of, Montana. Our subsequent home in Montana centered our family in a new kind of way. It was a place that nourished our spirits and our souls. On the face of it, you might think 2,000 miles is not the most convenient distance for a summer home. But Mom and Dad wanted us to really be able to get away, again, to explore and discover together, to construct a home, and to really be together when we weren't distracted by high school parties or social obligations or professional obligations. 
There we could swim, hike, water ski, sag around, that's his word for relaxing. But what Dad valued most was when we were all working together. Solving problems, fixing what was broken, building things. He loved nothing more than the shared sense of accomplishment that resulted. And it's a reason that all of us and all of our kids, and I think a few other people out there in this congregation, know how to shingle a roof, put a diagonal place on a diving tower, hammer underwater, or drive down a two-lane highway with an eight-foot sheet of plywood in the back of it. And that's a car, not a truck. So, it's possible that we don't all use those skills in our day-to-day -day lives right now, but Dad knew what we were really building was something else. Confidence. We thought that we could do anything. Bonds and deep relationships that would extend beyond his lifetime. And he's right, they have. And they'll endure. Alright, my topic of love is through physical touch. And Dad's physical touch conveyed love throughout his family life, just as he had learned from his family growing up. He had learned from his father, when he was proud of you, he'd reach out his hand and say, put it there, tippy top. Or what we do still, at the end of grace, at every dinner, you grab hands and you shout, tippy top, one, two, three, hooray! Still do it. So, Another favorite for generations of all the Calhoun children bouncing on Dad's knees as he sang, Pony boy, pony boy, won't you be my pony boy? Or trot to trot to Boston for hours. I don't know how he did it. But when we had the opportunity to watch everything that Dad built, from the boats, we talked about the model railroads, the sets of Calhoun Productions, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> Whether he had a microphone, a gavel, or he was mixing his perfect Rob Roy, Dad was never idle. He was a doer. He had to do things. Of course, the crown, uh, the jewel in his crown, is the cabin in Montana. Because not only did we use tools, but we learned how to art smart, outsmart a problem. So here's a good story. About 12 years ago, we embarked on yet another edition. <clears throat> this time, it was a quilt studio for Mom. And we had a crew of two youthful yet middle-aged daughters, um, <laughs> several teenage grandchildren, and then a few younger grandchildren recruits. We put the whole frame together, raised the sides of the studio, but they weren't plumb which means level and straight and all that, okay? So, Dad had to put his hands on some unique tools to jerry-rig a situation. So, using a heavy length of chain, he wrapped it around the top of the frame that was in question, attached it to the 85 Colony Park station wagon, pulling it taut, and then with those two daughters hanging on that chain like a couple of sloths, we provided the downward force for the grandkids to hammer it home, and it worked. <laughs> sloth number one, sloth number two. So, Dad had the touch. You, you cannot imagine how much you learn just by watching, and by being taught with those beautiful hands. So, as our Heavenly Father joins the Heavenly Father, as he said to us many times, this is our Father, whom we love, in whom we are well pleased.
remember him. And so the table since that day has long been the central symbol of fellowship that we ought to embody in this world as Christians and as all people. So that at the heart of our life together is to be the truth that we are friends. Table and the fellowship of friends is as close as we get to the communion of heaven and earth in this world. I have long been convinced that friendship is the highest form of love. Roland, and of course his companion Shirley, exemplify that way of life like few I have ever known. You know, these days you're hearing a lot about conspiracy. Let me say a word about what that means. It comes from two words, con, the Latin word for together, and spira, spire, which means spirit, to breathe together. So we can put to breathe and together, together, and it means to breathe together. So to, cons to conspire is to breathe together. Let's do that together. You're conspiring. <laughs> and isn't that a much more harmonious understanding of what conspiracy ought to be about in this world? Learning to breathe together around goodness. Now, one way to characterize Roland and no less Shirley's life was that it was a conspiracy. Of friendship. The consistent effort to cultivate the conditions in which friendship would thrive. He was not so much, as I said earlier, the center as much as the director setting up the scenes. And of course, all of that would have been impossible to do without the elegant spirit of Shirley as his co-conspirator. You know, we rarely discuss theology, Roland and myself, as I recall, but my sense is, as has been said today, Roland had a deep and abiding faith that it would have been impossible for him to conceive of his life, his sense of purpose and calling, whether in public or private, apart from his sense of and for God. It was deeply personal for him and abiding. And it was here that his life and faith began and was nurtured. And so it is fitting that we are here and bearing him to his final resting place to await that great day when all will be gathered once again in that great banquet hall of God's kingdom, our final and abiding home. The words that were read earlier from 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy are surely fitting for this moment, this very moment in Roland's life. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Roland has left an impression that fire outsizes the impact of, that one's life usually makes. And we are all here today as witnesses who feel the immensity of his life and the intensity of his love of life and friendship. As one of the earliest Christian teachers said, the glory of God is the human being fully alive. The glory of God is infinitely magnificent. And I think we are on safe ground today to say that the life of Roland Blanchard Calhoun was one bright and shining instance of that magnificence. Thanks be to God. Let's say that together. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Could you please stand together? Following the prayer of commendation, we will invite all of you to sing our final hymn, which is in your hymnal, the red hymnals that are there before you in your pews. We'll be turning to number eight, and we'll be singing the first and last verses of that wonderful hymn. Please pray with me. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant Roland with all your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of humankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth we shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Roland Blanchard Calhoun. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. And now hear us together as we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.